well, first of all, thanks for the invitation for uh, giving a talk about one of the projects uh, that started a few years uh, in my lab in Lancaster, in the Lancaster Environment Center. And we call it uh, this initiative, Tomatoes for Tomorrow. So in this talk, what I will be talking about, of course, is um, uh, impact of global change in agriculture, and in particular, impact uh, in tomatoes. Uh, my lab in, in Lancaster Environment Center uh, is a plant molecular photobiology lab. Uh, I'm a molecular biologist that have spent a long time uh, looking uh, at the light photoreceptors and signaling cascades. Uh, I'm very interested in the light photoreceptors because they are the sensors of lots of environmental signals. Uh, but in particular, my lab uh, is interested in how these photoreceptors, light and temperature in particular, impact uh, plant metabolism and therefore uh, they um, integrate a signal to modulate plant growth. Um, in, in my lab particularly we looked uh, at two types of photoreceptors, uh, the phytochromes that are my favorites uh, and uh, the cryptochromes, mainly uh, the red light receptors and the blue light receptors. And what we know about phytochromes and cryptochromes uh, is that they are not only light sensors, but they are also temperature sensors. And in particular, one of the, my favorite pathways, biochemical pathways in plants, is the MEP pathway of isoprenoid biosynthesis. This, the MEP pathway, is a chloroplastic pathway, uh, and it's uh, probably one of the key pathways for a plant because from this pathway, the, uh, the derivatives from this pathway um, give rise to many growth regulators, uh, call it, for example, cytokinins, uh, giverellins, uh, apocarotenoids that are also plant hormones, uh, and also to the photosynthetic pigments. Intermediates of, this, uh, of the MEP pathway are used for chlorophyll, for the tail of chlorophylls, as well as carotenoids. Uh, the other photopigments uh, are very active in plants. And uh, among the plant hormones, of course, uh, abscisic acid also is a derivative from carotenoids uh, that can tell you that the MEP pathway somehow is a sensor of stress. Uh, in my lab, in particular, we have been looking uh, at carotenoid biosynthesis as well as uh, vitamin E biosynthesis uh, and regulation by uh, light. Uh, another very important characteristic of this particular pathway is that um, derivatives of them, uh, of the pathway, uh, are also uh, leading to vitamins. Vitamin A, for example, is, is uh, deriva uh, it's a derivative from uh, carotenoids, um, beta carotene, uh, and uh, vitamin E and tocopherols uh, also come from the MAID pathway. Uh, and they are also involved in giving flavor or an aroma. Uh, uh, to uh, our food, uh, in particular, uh, for example, the, the production of terpenoids. So carotenoids in particular uh, are um, essential for the plants because they are part of the photosynthetic systems, but also, as I showed you, they are an important part as growth regulators, signaling molecules, uh, antioxidants, not only for humans, but for the plants, photoprotectants. Uh, and in case of humans, we need to eat them in our diet because we cannot biosynthesize them. Uh, in particular, the ones that are, uh, are uh, leading to vitamin A. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, this pathway is particularly sensitive uh, to climate change because it's heavily regulated by light receptors. Uh, and uh, one a key model system to study um, um, the MET pathway of isoprenoid biosynthesis and carotenogenesis is, of course, tomato, because carotenoids uh, are accumulated in very high levels uh, in tomato. As I said, uh, the production of these pigments um, uh, in particular um, and, and these vitamins derivatives from this pathway are also very important for nutrition. And, and, and the importance has been recognized recently because they are some of the um, vitamins uh, that um, contribute, the lack of these vitamins contribute to what is called hidden hunger. And that is affecting not only the developing world, but also the developed world. So uh, the uh, UN, uh, now recognizes the importance of eating well uh, and eating food that is diverse and high quality. So in terms of climate change, of course, uh, it's really worrying. 
um, if we think about what is going to happen in the world, in particular, places like uh, Africa, Latin America, and South Asia will be probably the first areas where global changes will be highly uh, severe. But climate change will also impact countries that are major food exporters, uh, call it China, US, Australia, Brazil, India. And they will suffer crop losses that will also impact on our food distribution chains. So in particular, let's, uh, we will be uh, focusing on the case of tomato uh, and uh, tomato production uh, is already uh, affected. Uh, for example, um, we had two particular events in 2015 and 2017, when either very hot temperatures in the spring or cold fronts uh, that affected Spain and Italy actually decimated the production of tomato. And there was no tomato in the UK during those times. Uh, so that it can be thinking, well, these kind of events, uh, actually Mexico, my, my home country, normally has production of tomato uh, in those temperature ranges and tomato is produced all across uh, the country. So Mexico is a very diverse country uh, and in particular in types of climates. So for example, we have 15 types of climate, Köppen climate types. Uh, and uh, this number of climates actually is higher than Brazil. That is other one, another one of the mega diverse countries in the world. Brazil has 12 uh, Köppen climate types. And it's not only uh, these general uh, climate types that can go from deserts in the north uh, to tropical forest uh, in the south and high altitude valleys in the center, uh, but also uh, in an enormous amount of uh, microclimates. So this is also linked to the fact that Mexico is a very diverse country in terms of, it's one of the mega diverse countries in terms of biodiversity and also in terms uh, of culture. Um, for example, he represented in the indigenous languages that are spoken still in Mexico. There are more, more than 160 indigenous languages still spoken in the country. And this also reflects in the gastronomy, a very diverse type, uh, very different type, um, food uh, in all the states uh, in Mexico. What else does Mexico have? Uh, Mexico has more than uh, 1,300 years of agrodiversity development. Actually, uh, there's some of these links have been forgotten, uh, but um, products like tomato actually made it from Mexico to Europe and then expanded through the world. And uh, this um, um, knowledge of tomato is ancestral and is heavily linked to the pre-Hispanic cultures in Mexico that were the ones that probably in the south of Mexico domesticated many um, cultivars uh, for world agriculture. So my original idea when I started this project was to use this agrodiversity link to different climates to study how the antioxidants and vitamins are produced uh, in plants. So in particularly concentrated in carotenoids, tocopherols and flavonoids. I couldn't go and sample all, all Mexico because it's a very big country, uh, but uh, but we could uh, we selected for the study a state in the southern part of Mexico that is called Oaxaca, and Oaxaca is a repre is representative is a mini Mexico in some way because it's the state with highest numbers of indigenous tribes. It has uh, high production of diverse agricultural um, goods. Uh, it has uh, long-standing culinary traditions, and it um, particularly it has representation of almost all the climates that I show you. Uh, for Mexico. So the original idea was to go to Oaxaca and identify uh, the interesting agrodiversity and characterize it in particular for uh, starting with carotenoid productions and, and looking at temperature. But what did we find uh, when we arrived in Oaxaca? What we had is a tomato monoculture, a tomato monoculture that had swiped all the markets. I couldn't understand why. Why was this happening in, the in one of the centers of tomato agrodiversity in the world? 
Well, one of the main reasons was shifting into tomato markets and uh, the North American Trade World, uh, North American Trade Agreement uh, with the US and Canada. So as you can see, Mexico uh, produces most of the um, vegetables uh, imports uh, that uh, the US imports uh, and also a good part uh, of Canada's. So two thirds of the vegetables that are um, imported uh, by the US come from Mexico. And there have, you know, this has also set trends in terms of preferences, um, in particular in terms of shelf life, price, homogeneity of the products and processed foods. And also uh, there have been big modernization initiatives in Mexico to make us produce all these goods for export. So what has this cost? This has caused a recent loss, relatively recent in the last 20 years, a uh, recent loss of traditional varieties, not only of tomato, but many other uh, native and uh, ancestral cultivars from Mexico. And changes in agricultural production systems. The ancestral indigenous production systems are disappearing. And also with them, uh, the associated knowledge and culture. That is also world heritage. So what is actually quite worrying is that industrial production to of tomato is to increase in Mexico in the next uh, 30 years, in the next 10 years, where uh, we are ex uh, um, expanding twice our production in the next 10 years. And how are we going to do it? Well, we are going to introduce um, com commercial tomato production exactly in the areas that you can see here in red, where there is uh, ancestral agricultural practices and therefore agrodiversity. So this is quite a worrisome situation. So when I looked at this situation, I decided that the project that my original project had to expand and become a transdisciplinary project. So I recruited initially Jacob uh, from the Human Geography and Conservation of Lancaster, Christine and Lisa from uh, Nutrition and Secondary Metabolite Analysis uh, in Leeds, and um, Ben Neymark that is uh, involved in rural development. Uh, and uh, we had like um, some really, really great students working uh, in Mexico, in Lancaster, and in Leeds, Calu, John, and, and, and Guadalupe. So Tomatoes for Tomorrow is now a program to characterize, celebrate, research, and utilize uh, Mexican tomato agrodiversity to deliver nutritious cultivars uh, under global warming. So what we want to implement in Mexico is an in-situ conservation program. The in-situ conservation program that allows us to do all the biochemical and um, molecular and genetic uh, related characterization of this material, but also that allows um, farmers to keep producing them, uh, keep the traditional knowledge, as well as generate sustainable exploitation options. Uh, including cultural revalorization and new markets, and, pro uh, and uh, importantly, uh, importantly uh, protect uh, these resources so they can be shared with the world. So my initial uh, uh, a small team now grew into a team that involves several major um, um, uh, research institutions in Mexico, like UNAM, UACM, um, Polytechnic Institute, uh, Colpos, Ethnobotanical Garden, and the Mexican government, um, the seed certification services uh, from the Secretary of Agriculture. So we published recently uh, the report of our first findings in Mexico uh, in Plant People and Planet, if you're interested in, in looking at more details. So, but the first task that we had uh, was to find this agrodiversity because it's not observable anymore uh, in the market. Uh, so where are uh, the um, Oaxacan tomatoes? So together with the Ethnobotanical Garden, we started collections. So in, in terms of Mexico, the Colpos uh, had already started collections and has around, around 600 accessions in their collections. But as you can see in this map, not a single state in Mexico has been fully mapped, but in particular the whole north, even though it might be less agrodiverse, uh, it hasn't been explored at all. Uh, so for our particular study, uh, looking at temperature, we decided to do collections in two extreme regions in Oaxaca. 
um, La Mixteca, that where we had temperatures uh, during tomato production of 14 degrees, and uh, uh, La Costa, where we had 35 degrees during tomato production. And commercial tomato optimal uh, temperatures are around 25. So we started gathering uh, this agrodiversity and characterized it. The first characterization was biochemical. So we looked at the cold tomatoes, cold uh, grown tomatoes, and the warm uh, grown uh, varieties that we collected and compared it with a commercial tomato that here uh, is in indicated as CS. Um, so these commercial tomatoes, you can see uh, the native varieties from Mexico can accumulate higher levels either in the cold or in the warm uh, of lycopene. Uh, also of beta-carotene, some of them of beta-carotene for vitamin A. And in the case of tocopherol, uh, we saw that in, in, in cold temperatures, it was not that different from commercial tomato, but in the warm temperatures, there were um, varieties that accumulated very high levels of alpha tocopherol. So if we look at how this, uh, how this uh, MEP pathway of isoprenoid biosynthesis is regulated and producing the intermediates for these uh, carotenoids and tocopherols, uh, we see that there are key points uh, that are uh, regulated at the level of transcription uh, and then control the flux through the pathway. So uh, in the case of the MAC pathway is DXS, DXR, and HDR. And in the case of carotenoid biosynthesis, entry point is key, uh, controlled by phytoene synthase. So we started to look whether this uh, differential accumulation of uh, lycopene and carotenoids, um, beta-carotene in, in, um, in tomatoes in Mexico had also a, a relationship with uh, an overactivation of, of the MEP pathway. And as you can see here, we can see that DXS, DXR, HDR, and PSY are uh, in several of these varieties that have accumulation of uh, high levels of pigments uh, and, uh, alpha and tocopherols, also high levels of expression uh, of these genes. And, and this is actually either in the cold or in the warm. And this is actually quite interesting because these key genes we know uh, from a characterization in the lab that are extremely sensitive to temperature uh, and to light inputs. So what we have been uh, also looking at is starting to map the effects of the different um, photoreceptors, cryptochromes, phytochromes, uh, uh, and phytochrome A in far red, and red light, um, red light, uh, far red light, uh, blue light, as well as UV. Uh, and uh, mapping how these genes respond uh, to the different inputs, as well as uh, starting to identify uh, the molecular components that are linking this response from the photoreceptors uh, to potential transcriptional changes. Uh, so the classic, uh, Stuart already mentioned high five uh, and the pips so that, are, uh, that we have been putting them uh, in the map. And what we see is that PIFs and high 5 are actually quite interesting factors because they uh, give to these uh, genes from the MEP pathway very differential regulation. And that this differential regulation is, is achieved at the level of the promoters in the different genes. So making DXS an extremely dynamic uh, regulated uh, point, regulatory point for a light input into the pathway. So what else do these hand, land races have? Uh, um, well, one of the key things is, for example, drought tolerance. We have seen that compared to hybrids, tomatoes in Mexico could have 100% resistance to very extreme drought conditions. And, the, and this agrodiversity is from all the states uh, in Mexico, not only from Oaxaca, but represented in Oaxaca. So how can we actually preserve uh, these Mexican tomatoes for studies uh, in terms of plant science and, and for, uh, for uh, agriculture and for consumption? So what we need is really a transdisciplinary and transsectorial network that we have been building. So where we can link all these aspects uh, of conservation uh, to preserve uh, and uh, transmit uh, and allow the next generations to now get to know these tomatoes and use them under global warming. So the first thing we have been doing is celebration of this agrodiversity and traditional knowledge, giving, uh, trying to move, um, give empowerment to our uh, to Mexican 
um, traditional uh, farmers that have been the custodians uh, of these seeds for centuries. So there are emergence of family, uh, farmer initiatives that are leading to seed conservation and sharing initiatives in situ conservation, participatory plant breeding and knowledge sharing, and we are linking uh, to them. So also we are working in the generation of new markets, for example, farmer markets in, the, in Mexico City that are getting, uh, that are accepting this agrodiversity and uh, making it known uh, in their local communities. And also the participation of the gastronomy community because Mexican cuisine is UNESCO World Heritage. So we are linking with chefs and traditional cooks to implement uh, a, produ a production and uh, use uh, and consumption uh, system uh, that also celebrates Mexican cuisine. So how are we doing this? Well, we are also creating community and generating public interest. For example, we organized the first Mexican ancestral tomato fair in Mexico City in 2019. And what went on? There were uh, farmer-led initiatives, for example, the seed exchange and seed selling, workshops by farmers on how to grow tomato, multidisciplinary conference led by academics and farmers, uh, we also had a farmer's market to show this agrodiversity. We had the participation of the gastronomy community giving um, conferences, but also teaching, um, like leading uh, cooking workshops uh, for uh, showing how to use uh, uh, the, these tomatoes and the different flavors that they provide. Uh, and uh, I think that the most important thing of these sort of initiatives was the community of, um, community feeling uh, and uh, the transsectorial networks that are necessary for an in-situ conservation program. So diversity is recognized now by the UN uh, as probably our best insurance um, to fight climate change in uh, and changes in agriculture. So it is actually quite important that we revalorize the traditional agricultural knowledge uh, that, and also the systems that have shown that are very adaptable and also sustainable in changing conditions. So top priorities uh, for the world is to actually conserve these, foods, uh, these food systems and their agrodiversity uh, towards food security under global warming. And in particular, I think that work with mega diverse countries like Mexico that, is, uh, that are rapidly losing their agrodiversity is key. So the challenge of course is to protect and uh, maintain and use this agrodiversity in conditions uh, of a globalized world with economical, social, uh, uh, developmental changes and, and also cultural identity uh, changes. So uh, what I, I think that we are still in time and get to know these indigenous ancestral production systems uh, and uh, learn some lessons that we could use uh, for research, uh, basic research in plant science, but also to deliver options uh, to achieve food security under climate change. And with this, I finish. And if you're more interested, um, you can uh, look at our website uh, or uh, email me. And I am happy to take questions. That's, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Gabriela. It's such a super interesting uh, and wide ranging project. And, and for those of you that don't know, Gabriela is actually in Mexico City at the moment as she's, she's speaking to us from there. Yes. Um, previously stuck, but it's not stuck anymore and coming back to the UK soon, I think. Um, okay, so um, if anyone has any questions, again, please put them into the, the Q&A uh, or into the chat or, or put your, your virtual hand up. Um, let me ask, first of all, Gabriela, I mean, it strikes me really that there's such a huge difference between that 14 degree average and that 35 degree average areas. And I mean, it might be a little bit of a trivial question, but also perhaps the most important. So how is the taste difference between those tomatoes that are grown in, in those you know, varying uh, climatic chain differences? Yes, it is actually quite uh, interesting because you would expect that probably the cold grown tomatoes don't have much of a taste, but this is not the case. Right. This is not the case. It's actually, we also uh, did some other analysis, for example, some sugar content on organic acids on vitamin C, and it's amazing uh, because uh, they, they, they also have differential contents of these uh, other uh, compounds. Uh, and uh, the flavor uh, is different from the warm areas. Warm areas tend to be probably much more aromatic, uh, but they are actually quite tasty. 
Okay. And have you brought back many um, of these tomatoes back to Lancaster? Are you growing them? Are you able to grow them? Okay. No, actually, this is another thing that I mentioned briefly, is because the seed is not registered yet okay. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that we need to do and that we have started with the Secretary of Agriculture is registration of the material. So once the, it's registered uh, in the Secretary of Agriculture, then we can start exchanging. Okay, okay, I see. And, and again, before hopefully some questions will come in, but let me ask about the time scale um, of, of the, pro uh, the project. So have you, it sounds like it's been going for a couple of years already. Um, yes. What's kind of the time scale of it? I mean, I know this this could last for a long, long time, but have you got funding for a certain amount of time to kick off? Uh, the, yes, it's like the next step is, is um, um, we have um, some funding for next year to keep working okay. on what we are already doing. And of course, we are looking actively for, for more funds, mm -hmm. uh, but also we are uh, starting to lobby uh, the Mexican government. Okay, okay. So, I mean, there's obviously potential funding from all sorts of different places from, from yes and 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 AFAO. yeah absolutely okay cool 